Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. And this is what it says. After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who is seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is God's word for us this morning. Thankful for it. Um, The last two weeks, we've been looking at Revelation 17 and 18. And in it, Pastor Howie has been been leading us on to understand what this imagery, this symbol of the prostitute means. And as we've understood it from scriptures, what it it refers to is the worldliness, the the seduction of this world that draws people into it. The pleasures that are really not fulfilled in Jesus, the pleasures that are really not fulfilled in who God is, but are rather lead to destruction. And and last week, Pastor Howie talked about in Revelation 18 about how the response of the people of earth when God punished the prostitute, not as a a person per se, not, not specifically a person, but more of like an ideology, more of the idea of, of God removing the, the worldliness of this world and punishing it, God removing this, the seduction of this world. And we read the response of the people when they've lost Babylon, that's another name for the prostitute, all that draws people in, all that seduction that draws people in. We remember <clears throat> the response of the people. They said, alas, alas which in, in other terms means woe or woe. They're mourning over it. They're weeping over the things that they had, the material things, the, the empty relationships, the, the <clears throat> physical temporary fulfillments. They're weeping and mourning over these things. And, and I think very appropriately put, one of the things Pastor Howie brought our attention to last week was that our current struggle in our Western culture is that we are far more likely to be seduced by the world than to be persecuted by it. We are far more likely to be seduced by the world than to be persecuted by it. Now, persecution will come. It is, it is a main truth of the Bible. It's what brings us to God that we set, are set apart. We look different than the world and they will oppose us for that. And today what I would like us to look at is a complete turn of the corner. Whereas in chapter 18 where people are mourning, where people are, are weeping over these things that they've lost, there's a celebration in heaven in chapter 19. There's a celebration of the almighty God. Now if you, if you were to take the two different types of people that are talked about here, you, if you contrast the two, notice how one is mourning and one is celebrating. There's a clear distinction, again, like Revelation brings us to, where Revelation says the people of the earth, and it's referring to those who have not chosen God, those who have not chosen to follow God, who are not serving him, who have followed the ways of the world, fallen into temptation, and have refused God the Almighty. These are the people who are lamenting and crying out over these things that they've lost. But in verse 19, we read about the multitude of the heavenly hosts, not just angels, but saints and all the people in heaven crying out in celebration to our God. Kind of like how church should be, right? (laughs) 
It should be. But sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes we want to do anything but celebrate God. I don't know if you've had one of those weeks. I don't know if you're having one of those days. One of those days where it just seems that, sure, God is big, but life just seems so much bigger than God right now. All the stress. You know, my kids are driving me crazy. I'm having struggles in my marriage, (laughs) financial troubles. How do I celebrate God? when my life is so huge right now, when this life just seems to be looming over me. We don't celebrate God because we have let life get bigger and more important than God. We have. I think this this is illustrated best by... uh, a story that I heard once by a college professor of mine. He talked about how he went to visit his brother, and his brother had uh, two young boys, uh, two young boys, and he would go there and, and visit them, and he would, upon coming in the door, he'd, he'd go and, and sit down on the couch, and the two nephews, uh, his two nephews, would come bouncing out and all excited and happy and give him a hug, you know, and be excited to see him, and the one would start to go something like this. They would say, say, uncle, 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 you got to see this new toy that I got. Look what, look what I have. Look what I'm, look at this cool new toy. And wait, uncle, look at this. I learned how to do a cartwheel. I can do a cartwheel. I can do a somersault. Does anybody else have kids like that? I have, I know I have kids like that, right? Right. Jumping up and down, just vying for your attention, right? Look what I can do. Look what I can do. I can do this. I can, I can, you know, I, I've learned how to tie my shoes. I've learned how to ride a bike. Look at all these things. And And that was the one child, but the second child would just simply just climb up on his lap and would just sit and cuddle with him. See, for the first child, it was all about what this child could do. Look at what I can do. Look what I can do. Look what I've got. And for the second child, it was just about being with the uncle. And sometimes we treat God like that. Sometimes we make it more about us. I I would would dare to say most of the times we make it more about us than we do about him. Worship and celebration, it can be likened to, to these two young boys. So often we're just trying to get all the praise for ourselves. Look at me, look what I can do, look what I've got. But worship calls us to climb up onto the lap of God. And just say, I love you. I want to be with you. I want to know you. That's true worship. And I would say today that the goal of a Christian's life is the celebration, is the making much of who God is. And we read that in this chapter. Many, many, many years ago, there was this um, teaching that was written It's called the Westminster Catechism. And if you're wondering what the word catechism means, it just means teaching. Basically, it has to do with Sunday school. It was what they taught their kids hundreds of years ago. And basically what they did for the Westminster Catechism is they'd ask a series of questions and they'd have a series of answers. And it would teach their children theology. It would teach them doctrine. It would teach them about who God is. Probably one of the greatest things ever coined in the Westminster Catechism, the greatest sentence, uh, I believe, is, from my opinion, is that, is this. They, the question is asked, what is the main purpose of life? What is the main goal of life? What is the chief end of man? And this response goes like this. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Do you know what? We can enjoy glorifying God. We can. There are times it's hard. There are times it's difficult because, and I think so often it's because we allow life to take that place that only God can fill in our lives. 
We get so caught up in idolatry. We get so caught up in, in things that just try and take our attention away from him. But if we are truly focused on him, if we truly understand our identity in him, we will truly enjoy him. We will enjoy him. So today, I want us to see through this passage how we enjoy God, how we celebrate God. Now, up until now, the majority of Revelation has been about judgment. So why on earth would there be celebration after judgment? Why? It just seems so sadistic. It seems so messed up that God would, would bring his heavenly hosts or that they would come to a party after he's done all of these things against the world. He's punished those who are caught up in sin. He's gone against the beast. He's gone against the prostitute, all these worldly things. Well, I, I would dare to say today that it's not specifically the judgment that is being celebrated here, but rather what this judgment is leading to. And let me explain that for a second. You see, God's judgment on the wicked cannot, cannot be separated from the fact that God is making everything right. Because if it's just God's judgment, if it's just God pounding on us for evil things, and it's not because he's trying to remove sin from our world so that he can have proper and right eternal relationship with us, what's the point? God's judgments have purpose. He is bringing his kingdom into being. God's judgment can, from, on the wicked cannot be separated from the fact that God is making everything right, and that is something to celebrate. God is making things right, and he will make things right. So as we look at Revelation 19, 1 to 10 today, we see a, a common word, a word that's used in a lot of our worship songs. It's a Hebrew term called hallelujah, right? Hallelujah. Now, interestingly enough, the word hallelujah is used in the Old Testament all the time. Words of expression, praise to God, the Psalms, you go there and you'll see hallelujah. But in the New Testament, only used four times. And all four are in this passage. All four are in this passage. And I think it's because, really, John's trying to get us to understand that God is worth celebrating. He is worth making a big deal about in our lives. He's not somebody that we just focus in on Sundays. He's somebody that should be be the center and focus of who we are. We shape our worldview around who God is. We live our lives around who God is. And so our lives should constantly be singing out hallelujah, which in Hebrew means praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. Praise God. That's what it means. So I want us to look today at the four hallelujahs in this passage. I think it's significant, and I, I, I'd like us to see how this, um, I would like us to see that we are, as Christians and as followers of Jesus, have something to celebrate in who God is. We have something to celebrate. The first hallelujah, let's read there, verses one and two. It says, after this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his saints. So what is happening in this verse? First of all, God has saved his people. He has saved his people. He's removed them from the persecution of Babylon or the prostitute, the harlot, as we read about in the, the scriptures, whom in chapter... I believe it's chapter 17, we read that she's drunk with the blood of the saints. That means she is going against God. She is persecuting the church, God's people, killing them. And God has saved his people. He's judged the prostitute and avenged the persecution of his people. First of all, this. We worship God because he alone has saved us from sin. We worship God because he alone alone has saved us from sin. God saves those who are lost in sin. His judgments are true and just. He is righteous. He avenges those who suffer at the hand of sin. That's the amazing thing, isn't it? Like God is not going to let any sin. God is not going to let 
any sin go unavenged? Have you suffered at the hands of sin? Have you sinned against someone else? God is going to make things right. God is going to make things right. And what's amazing about this is that Christianity is not about what we have done, but rather it is about what God has done. Doesn't this change our perspective? Doesn't this change the way we should look at things? It's not about what I do to make God happy. It's not about my actions. It's not about me trying to <clears throat> make God happy with me. Look at me. Look at the things that I'm doing. It's more already about what he's done. It's about what Jesus has done. This changes our perspective. For example, let me use a little example here. The Bible, okay? So many times we read the Bible as an instruction booklet. You might have heard this before. Um, someone came up with this cheeky and cute <laughs> <clears throat> way of understanding what the Bible means. They call it basic instructions before leaving earth, right? That's not right. Can I just say that's not biblically sound? The Bible is not a book of instructions for us to follow. It is about God first and foremost. Now, there are instructions in here. Don't get me wrong. There are things that, that challenge us and show us what a life of following God looks like. Don't, don't hear me wrong. But first and foremost, this is a book about an almighty God who is transcendent, who is holy, who is, is so good, so pure. And we are so sinful. We are so lost in our ways. And God just wants to reveal himself to us. And he does so through his word. The story from the beginning to the end is about God. In the beginning, God. And even when we get to the very end, God, forever and ever, amen. That's what this book is about. It's not about you. It's about him. And I think Herbert Lockyer says it best. He says, the Bible is for us, but it is not about us. The Bible is for us, to understand God, to grow in our relationship with God, but it is not about us. We can trust the God who does what is right. Are you struggling right now in understanding this God who maybe you don't understand all his ways, why he's allowed certain things to happen to you, why he's <clears throat> brought things in your, put things in your life? Psalm 22 says this, you might remember some of these, this verse, verses one and two and three I'm going to read. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. And by night I find no rest. Anyone else have a similar thought or cry out to God in times of of, of pain in times of sorrow. But, but look what David wrote, writes in verse three. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In, your fa in, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. And the rest of the psalm goes on and on. And David, what starts out is something so in incredibly painful and tough and a heavy weight on David just erupts into glorious praise. Why? Because he's reflecting on who this God is who has saved him. All this that God has given him and blessed him and is leading him into, he is faithful to him to lead him out of it. I wish our lives were more like that. I wish my life was more like that. That even when I'm having those rough times, when I'm, you know, when I'm struggling in my walk with God, when I'm struggling in my relationships, that I can say, God, I just need your help right now. And that God would just reveal his presence and power to me. And it would just erupt into praise. How often are we praising when we're on our knees? How often are we praising God when we're on our knees? How often are we celebrating who he is?
Psalm 22 starts with my God, my God, and ends in glorious praise. Let's move on quickly to the second hallelujah. The second hallelujah. Second hallelujah is in verse 3. It says, once more they cried out, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. This is the multitudes in heaven again crying out hallelujah. Praise God because of God's victory over the prostitute. Judgment was poured out on the prostitute, on Babylon, and it remains an, as an example that God has won. He's not only saved us, he's not only avenged us, but God has defeated sin. God has defeated, he has victory over this world. Jesus himself says, in this world you're gonna have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's the God we serve. He is bigger, larger than life. He he has overcome the world. We worship God because he alone is victorious over sin. Now again, I'll say this. Just as Christianity is not about, just as Christianity is not about you, it's about God. And it, Christianity is not about your victory over sin. It's not you who has the power to, take, to defeat sin in your life. It's God's victory at work within you. It's his victory over sin. Otherwise, why would Jesus come? Why would Jesus die on the cross? If it was up to you to save yourself, if it was up to you to say, I can beat that addiction myself. If it was up to you to say, I can overcome this hardship myself, then what's the point of Jesus coming? Christianity is not about your victory over sin, but his victory over sin. And, and can I say this as a little side note? His victory leads to relationship. His victory leads to relationship because if you were victorious over sin yourself, if you had the power to to overcome your faults and all your weaknesses, if you were the one who could take your own sin and deal with it, you would have only yourself to thank. But because God is the one who has defeated sin in your life, you are drawn to him. Because God is the one who has given you that free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. Because God is the one who has said, I, your sins are atoned for through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That just makes us want to know him more, doesn't it? Like, think about it. If you're walking down the street and someone just coming the other way just reaches out and gives you a $100 bill. And just hands it to you and says, here, take it. And just keeps walking. How many of you would probably turn around and be like, whoa, 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 what's, what's the deal? Why did you, why, you want to know more, right? And see, this is what God does for us. He gives us this gift and he draws us into himself. He wants us to know him. He wants us to have relationship with him. It's God's victory for his glory so that it draws us in to relationship with him. This is the second hallelujah. The third hallelujah, the third hallelujah, in verses four and five, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, saying, amen, hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Now, the 24 elders and the four living creatures that we've heard about is is a reflection back to Revelation chapter 4, and, and some people think simply that they are a symbol of what is referred to as the Old Testament and the New Testament. <clears throat> In the 24 elders, you have, um, you have the 12 tribes of, of Israel, and also you have the 12 <clears throat> excuse me, you have the 12 disciples in the New Testament. So people just view the 12, 24 hour elders as symbolically meaning God's word come together, Old Testament, New Testament. And the four living creatures, they're actually some. Uh, evidence that thinks that uh, refers to the Gospels that were written, uh, the four living creatures referred to in Ezekiel. Um, some people draw them out to, to mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, the, the Gospels that were written about Jesus. Now, that's just a method of interpretation of those things. Um, <clears throat> but what we learn in this passage is that these 24 elders and the four living creatures, they echo and affirm the hallelujahs with their own hallelujah. And a voice from heaven calls everyone to praise him. 
We worship God because he alone has authority over all things. He has saved us. He is victorious over sin. And God alone has authority over all things. He is in control over the people of the earth and all that exists. But that's not the way we see God, is it? Or at least we don't live our lives that way. Christian Smith, um, this researcher, a Christian researcher, uh, I believe he's a sociologist as well, um, penned a term in the last couple of years referring to our culture's view of God. He calls it moralistic therapeutic deism. Try saying that 10 times fast, okay? Moralistic therapeutic deism. And all that is is a, is a big term to refer to how people have viewed God in our culture, in our, in our secular world. This is how God is viewed. First of all, God, a God exists... This is their belief. A God exists who created and ordered the world and watches over human life on earth. Secondly, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other, as taught in the Bible and by most world religions. Number three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. Number four, God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. And number five, good people go to heaven when they die. This is a generic view of God, and it is, it, sadly enough, it's even infiltrated our churches. It's come into our churches, too, where we believe, well, if I just live a good life, if I just... If I just you know, do what I, I can, do the best that I can, God will accept me. Now, the question is, how do you determine what is good enough? Who is that authority that gives, that tells you, this is what's good enough? Is 999 sins okay, but a 1,000? Mm-mm. That's not good enough. See, moralistic therapeutic deism is just a way of viewing God as this divine butler, This God who says, okay, God, when I need you, I'll come for you. I'll call for you. And you better show up. And you better deliver. See, that Christianity is not about God at all. It's not about us serving God. It's about God serving us. That's what we've turned this belief in God into. Well, if God is like that, then I can't believe. If God judges people, then I can't believe in a God like that. Who is really the God in that situation? Us. We have made so much of our lives, our religions, our everything. We've made it about us. But following Jesus calls us to deny ourselves, right? And take up our cross and follow him. God, and here's the thing, if you... If you can't believe in a God, and I've said this before, but if you can't believe in a God that argues with you, that challenges you, you that corrects you, that, that will lead you into some hard times, if you can't believe in a God like that, can I just suggest that your God really isn't the true God of the Bible? He's just a cardboard cutout, and you'll have absolutely no relationship with him whatsoever. Because, like, let's look at it this way. In my marriage, if, if I controlled every aspect of our relationship, is that really a marriage? Is that really a relationship? Am I really knowing my wife if I don't understand the things that, that hurt her, the things that, that, that excite her, the things that, are, that maybe I'm struggling with, if, if we don't have those disagreements? See, we will disagree with God. We will have times that we will struggle in in walking through phases of our lives, like walking through tough times where you've lost somebody, somebody who's very close to you, walking through a time where, you know, you just, you wish where your children are rebelling, walking through a time where you don't have a job, And those are very tough and difficult things, but those should cause us to press into God, not pull away from him, to press into him. 
I just want to read to you a very important psalm, I, I believe, that, that demonstrates God's authority in a very powerful way. Um, psalm chapter 97, and this has to do with, with God's authority, and I want to read it to you here because I think it's just so powerful. Um, <clears throat> you can read along there with me if you'd like. Psalm chapter 97, this is what it says. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the people see his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods, small g. Zion hears and is glad. And the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Right, rejoice in the Lord, O oh, you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. Does that sound like a butler to you? Does that sound like some guy who comes at the ding of a bell? This is our God, the ultimate authority in our lives, the one who gives life and breath, the one who has purposed for you what you are going to encounter today before you even knew it. He knows when you sit and stand, he created you in your inmost being, in your mother's womb. This is the God whom we serve. He has the authority We've made Christianity about serve God serving us, not us serving God. Lastly, I want to jump into the fourth hallelujah. The fourth hallelujah in verses six to nine, I'll read them there. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride, his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints." And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Now, if you take this and contrast this, compare it to this vision or this image of God's bride, which is the church. It's symbolic of the church. We are called the church. We are called God's bride, rather. Um, if you compare this to the prostitute written about in Revelation 17 and 18, what a difference, eh? The, the prostitute in Revelation 17 and 18, clothed in purple, who, who is all about immorality and deceiving people. Whereas we read here about the bride of Christ is clothed in righteousness. The bride of Christ is delighted in by God. There's a celebration. In this last hallelujah, we again hear the multitude crying out in a much louder voice, singing a song of celebration to God in eager expectation of the wedding of Jesus to his bride. I don't know if you've noticed this before, but in Revelation, um, a lot of the images that are used just reveals that Satan loves to make a mockery of God. He takes the things that God has, has revealed to his servants and, and he uses them and twists them. Isn't that the truth of what, God, what, what, sorry, what Satan does to the gifts that, he, that God has given us? Take sex, for example, right? Man, we've heard, we can't stop hearing about that one. Satan has taken that one, what, something that is good and right and pure within marriage, something that God blesses a couple with, Satan takes it and twists it, right? 
He says, you can do that with whoever, with whatever. That's what we've turned. That's what Satan is all about, taking the things of God and twisting them and making them a mockery. That only in God we find their fulfillment. Only in God they find their true place. See, we worship God because he alone will make everything right. He alone will make everything right. Now, I know some of us, when we look at this image of the wedding, of marriage, it can be difficult for some of us, just in the way it is difficult for some of us to look at God as Father. Maybe some of you have had a really bad experience with your father. And in so doing, when we preach in, up here, um, we talk a lot about you know, God as our heavenly father. And to you, that might not be a good picture. Just as in the same way, when we refer to this picture of marriage, it might not be a good picture to some of you. Can I say to you that God's definition of marriage is far greater, far much more intimate, far, far much more than what we can ever imagine or understand Tim Keller illustrates it this way. This is what he, he views as heavenly marriage and, and it's heavenly marriage that God should bring us to. Tim Keller says this in his book, The Meaning of Marriage. He says, to be loved but not known is comforting but is superficial. To be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. Marriage is a place for us to 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 develop intimacy with one another. And how we do that is by revealing more and more of ourselves to each other, showing our weaknesses, showing our strengths, revealing ourselves, being vulnerable with one another, right? But all too often, marriage takes a tough turn when we are not loved for that being vulnerable. And then on the opposite, to be loved but not known, to just say, I love you, but I don't want to know you, is purely superficial, It's purely shallow, really. That's not true love. And Tim Keller goes on, he says, but to be fully known, to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. To be truly, fully known and truly loved is a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than ever anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us at our own self-righteousness, and it fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. This is what it means to be married by married to God, to be committed to him, to be devoted to him, is that we are fully known and truly loved. And we all long for that. We are all longing for that. I just want someone to understand me, but they don't. I can't tell you how many <clears throat> teenage girls I've seen this in. I just want to be loved. I just want to be loved. And, our, and I'll say as Christians, we haven't done a great job of demonstrating a marriage that looks like we are truly known and truly loved. But God, in his grace, in his mercy, says here, know me. How do I know this? Jesus. Jesus didn't just step out of heaven and hop onto a cross and then hop back into heaven. He came as a baby. He grew up. Like most other Young boys. He became a man. He took up the trade of a carpentry and followed God and showed us who God is in the flesh. He showed us who he is. And then if that wasn't enough for him to say, I'm God, for him to say, to him to say, you can know me. He says, let me show you how much I love you. Let me show you how much I love you. And he 
goes to the cross and suffers a painful, horrible death. And not even just a physical death, but this spiritual pain of God's wrath being poured out. The judgment for your sin being poured out on Jesus Christ. Why did he do this? Why did Jesus do this? Because he wants to be with you forever. He wants to devote himself to you. He wants to be committed to you. He wants to have the joy of being together. John uses this imagery of Christ's relationship to the church because it carries with it a powerful picture of what a perfect relationship with Jesus is and what it will look like. It looks like joy. It looks like celebration. It looks like the beginning of a new life together. Intimacy, oneness, commitment, delight in one another. That's what our commitment to Jesus is. Is And that's what his commitment to us is. And that's what the commitment is we look forward to when we will be with God forever. We will be with Jesus forever in heaven. Something else that Tim Keller says, and I just want to challenge you men with, if you're having struggles with understanding yourselves as the bride of Christ. Tim Keller says this, men, you will never be a good groom to your wife unless you are first a good bride to Jesus. You will never be a good groom to your wife unless you are first a good bride to Jesus. Until you understand what it means. Like, look at what this passage tells us about us as the bride of Christ. The marriage of the Lamb has come in verse 7, and his bride has made herself ready. And get this it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. Who granted her that? Who is it that clothes us in righteousness? It is not by our own doing. It is by his. It is by what Jesus has done for us. The scripture says elsewhere that God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. And in that glorious exchange, God, Jesus, takes our sin and exchanges it with his righteousness. So we are seen before God righteous, not because of what we've done, not because you come to church, not because you've said a prayer, but because of Jesus and what he has done for us. Until we understand that, until we develop our intimacy with God, how can we develop our intimacy with one another? How can we grow as a church together. See, Christianity is not about self-centeredness. It is about relationship. And, and I'll, I'll say this. By Christ's example on the cross, it's a picture for, for us of what our marriages should look like. Marriages are not 50-50. I don't go halfway and expect my wife to come the other halfway. Well, look, I've already done this. You should be doing this for me. Is that true love? Is that true marriage? Marriage is 100%, 100%. And even if that person is not giving their 100%, you give yours. Because that's what Jesus did for us. Do you think we give our 100% for Jesus? (laughs) Guys, we fall flat on our faces We try so hard to be righteous. And even in the Bible, it says our righteousness, even the good things we do, it's like filthy rags. But Jesus still is like, I'm going to give you 100% of me. I'm going to give it all for you. That's a God who loves us. That's a God who desires intimacy with us. So in conclusion, here's what I want us to see. We are to worship God. Hallelujah. Worship God. It says in verse 10, John here, it says, then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. John himself, the disciple of Jesus, the the one 
whom Jesus loved, as we read about in the Bible, John himself was given over to idolatry, even in that moment. I, I love the way the Bible's written, because it, it in, in no way <laughs> paints every person that it's written about there in this perfect light, except for Jesus. John himself says, I, I bowed down to this angel. He was beautiful. He was great looking. I, I just, I thought that was pretty cool. So I bowed down to worship that. Even John reveals his sinfulness there, that he was going to bow down to this angel, and this angel says, hey, no way. I can't take glory. It's God alone who gets the glory. We worship God. That's what hallelujah means. It's the central theme of Revelation. We worship God and God alone. We don't worship Buddha. We don't worship Krishna. We don't worship Mary. We don't worship Joseph Smith, Mohammed, Baal. We don't worship our television sets, our tree spirits, our hockey teams, angels, presidents. We worship God. He is the one. That we pray. So I ask you here this morning, are you letting life get bigger than God? For the single mom, the worn out parent, the couple with marital issues, the unemployed father looking to provide for his family, the addict who doesn't believe he can recover, the suffering, those suffering loss, those who are, those who think you are good enough and those who think you aren't. Do you see the God who's larger than life? Do you see the God who is greater? The God who is able to walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. And get this, even in Psalm 23, it talks about God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Like there's a battle going on around, I love that imagery, there's a battle going on around us and God sets up a picnic, okay? Because he's like, hey, You got nothing to worry about. I've got this. Yeah, you may suffer some scars. Yeah, you may go through some tough things, but you know what? You've got me, and I've got you in the palm of my hand. I lastly want to read something for you. This is a a blog entry by a guy named Jonathan Stormont. He's a pastor in the States. This is what he says. God has given us much to celebrate. And yes, there is a time to dance and a time to mourn. But each season has its rightful place. But we've, what we've seemed to have done is made a lukewarm mixture of both. The spirit of despair is so easy to give into. Cynicism is the currency that we deal in, and Christians are no different. So I would like to suggest that churches pay attention to this more as a spiritual discipline, celebrating God. Because the kingdom of God has come and is coming. The future of God's reality is really, really good news. And celebration is God's way of orienting ourselves around that here and now. Just think, if you can celebrate God here in this life with all its pains and troubles and struggles, how much more are you going to celebrate him in heaven? And lastly, Jonathan says this, churches are at their best when they can show the world what a real party looks like. Isn't that the truth? right? But you ask anyone walking down the street, right? What do you think happens in there at Center Point Church? I don't know. They don't look too happy coming out of the church. (laughs) I hear they just want to take your money. But maybe, maybe, if we let this understanding of God is a God who has saved us, a God who has defeated sin, a God who is, has authority over all things, this God whom we serve, who is going to bring us into relationship with him, and he's going to make everything right. If we have that view, maybe then we'll make this the true party. And as we leave here today, and we meet that person walking down the street, we can say to them, you know what? It's like nothing else you've ever been to before. 
It's like nothing else you've ever seen. Because, guys, here, here's the reality. Is not the gospel good news? Is it not good news? Yeah. Like, as we look at this passage today, I think it's a clear reflection of what Jesus has done for us. The gospel is that Jesus alone has saved us from sin, and we say hallelujah. The gospel is that Jesus alone was victorious over sin, and we say hallelujah. The gospel is that Jesus alone has authority over all things. It says that God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus alone has authority over all things, and we say hallelujah. And lastly, Jesus alone has made everything right between us and God. And we say hallelujah. Is that not something we're celebrating on a Sunday morning? Now, the real question is, how much do you let that change you when you walk out from here? How much do you let that take over you? When life gets big, when life is coming at you like a wave, and it's just overtaking you, do you see the God who's bigger? And even in the midst of that, can you celebrate God? There's this uh, amazing song <clears throat> by this group named Casting Crowns. They're a worship band in the States, and the song goes, I praise you in this storm. And I will lift my hands. Next time you're going through a storm, can you lift your hands to God to celebrate him and say, you alone are the one. I thank you, God, even for this storm because it makes me rejoice more in you. It makes me realize how these things will not fulfill me in this life. These, these material things, these, these um, <clears throat> temporary things will not fulfill me. Only you will. And even in that, you will be given joy. And that joy will exceed happiness. That joy will last even when you get that phone call, even when you lose your job. Even when that person is suddenly taken from you, that joy you have in Jesus knowing that God is going to make everything right. Let's pray. Oh God, this is your word, and Lord, we say hallelujah to you because you are the God who is worthy of our praise. You are worth celebrating. And God, we want to press into that. God, even in, <clears throat> even in our struggles, even in our torment, even in our pain. God, we want to press in more and more to you. We don't want to pull back from you. We want more of you. So Jesus, I pray that Holy Spirit, you'd fall and work in this place, that God, we would be a place that celebrates you. We'd be a people that celebrate you. And everybody would know that Centerpoint Church points people to Jesus because he is worth celebrating. And God, I pray, Father, if there are people here even today that don't know you, God, that they would see that this Jesus has saved them. Has, <clears throat> this Jesus is, is calling them. Is calling them to follow him. And I pray, Jesus, that we would, would day after day make that choice, God, from morning till evening to say, we follow Jesus. And God, if there are people here who do, have not made that commitment, I pray that they would today. I pray, God, that they would. I pray that they would surrender themselves to Jesus, to that God, that God who has saved them, that God who has defeated sin and death on the cross. It wasn't enough for you, God, to just stay in the grave, but you broke through victoriously. And that God who has authority, that God who wants relationship who is bringing us into relationship, who is uniting us to himself to be known and to be loved. Thank you, Jesus, for paying it all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.